switch that input there, so I might have just moved it to the wrong one. Good morning, Lakeside. Good morning. Good morning. Is there something wrong over here? <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, it's good to see you all. You guys excited to be at church? Yes. It's a quiet start here, but uh, but we're ready. Let's uh, let's stand and let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, Father God, we just uh, come before you with uh, thankful hearts this morning. Thankful that we can come to church to gather together and to praise you. Uh, we just. We give you all the praise for, for everything that happens. The good and the bad, we're going to praise you in the storm. Yes, Lord. Uh, we just, uh, we ask for a great time learning and getting closer to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit uh, is here with us in, in our hearts. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive your words and to get to, to gain a little, little more knowledge about you to get closer to you. We just uh, ask all of this in your awesome and mighty name. Amen. Wow. Let's, uh, let's praise the Lord this morning. Yes. 
this morning. Let them know you're glad to see them.
1 John 1, uh, 5 through 9. I'm just going to read. This is the message we have from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Amen. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, he cleanses us from all of our sins. Is that good news this morning? Yes. We serve an awesome, a powerful, beautiful, wonderful Jesus. Let's uh, let's continue to sing about him this morning. Let's sing to him. Praise his awesome name.
All right, so we are uh, in a series on parables, and uh, I'm enjoying this. I I was familiar with this, but I saw it in a brand new way uh, this week. So I'm excited to get right into this this parable. This is going to be a good time. So some of us uh, are familiar with parables, some of us uh, are not. Parables are just stories to illustrate a point. Jesus used them a lot. There's other places in Scripture where parables parables are used. I try to think of some contemporary parables that teach uh, a lesson. And for whatever reason, I thought of the little boy that cried wolf. Anybody remember that one? There's other ones too. Then there's the guy with the thumb and the water and the wall or something. I don't remember what that one teaches. I don't know. Um, to be ready to stop, you know, floods. I don't remember that one. But, uh, but the, bo the little boy that cried wolf, right? What's the story? What's the motto of the story? Don't, you know, uh, leave yourself some headroom when you're freaking out about stuff, right? If you freak out about everything, nobody's going to listen when you, when you have the big freak out, right? Yeah. Leave yourself some headroom. So that's a, that's a contemporary parable. So Jesus used parables and uh, a couple things. Parables, remember we said, I mean, this was worth, this was worth coming last week, if nothing else was. Um, a, parable, uh, a parable, if we take it too far and we bend it and we stretch it and we tweak it too hard, we're going to come up with some strange doctrine, all right? I'm revisiting this this morning because it's very important this morning. <laughs> uh, so this is a, this is a cool, uh, interesting, and unique parable. You don't hear a lot about this one. So it's figurative language. There's usually... Um, one main point to a parable. Do you remember we said that? Usually one main point to that. Um, and a, a writer, uh, a pastor that I respect said, you know, maybe two for some parables, but there's usually just one thrust of the message. So you just kind of take the context, what was going on before that, and you can kind of take a look at what's going on after that, and you can kind of, kind of, kind of figure out what, what Jesus is going for. And you will recall that Jesus even said, I'm telling parables so that people like hard-hearted folks or uninterested folks will not get it. The point is that I want to hide the truth from hard-hearted folks. But people that are seeking, people that have a, a tender heart and are, are after me, are looking, after, uh, looking out for me, um, will be receptive to it and they may pick up the point. How many of you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you know that every parable isn't super easy to, to figure out? And that doesn't mean you're hard-hearted that day or you love Jesus you know, yesterday when you read a parable, but today you are messed up, man. There's something wrong with you. Some of these are, some of these are difficult. Um, another reason that Jesus told parables, we didn't mention this last week, was, and, the, and the reason that we should tell parables, is that it keeps the, uh, the listener's mind interested. Like, if you don't just come right out and tell the moral of the story, and it's kind of, you ha sort of have to figure out the moral of the story, it kind of keeps you thinking about it. You ever watch a movie, like usually like a weird movie, and, uh, you know, you, you thought maybe halfway through about shutting it off. Several come to mind. You thought, I'm just going to, this is dumb. But, but maybe there's the big, you know, there's some powerful message in here that, you know, they've been dancing around and it's going to hit me like a ton of bricks at the end. And then the movie's over and the credits start to roll and you're like, I, I don't know what that was. I don't know why I sat through that, right? Uh, so, and then we just go, ah, these crazy Hollywood people, they don't know what they're doing. But when Jesus told a parable, it sort of kept your mind engaged, like, and if he didn't explain it, like, you have to go and, and think about that thing, right? So I'm revisiting this from last week because I think it's really important uh, when we get into this parable because um, this one can be confusing, especially if we don't take seriously the part about take the main thrust of it, take the main point, and just go with that, okay? So, so Jesus has been sharing. He's been doing some teaching, and there's a mixture of... His disciples are present, and there are also the Pharisees. You know the Pharisees. Those are the religious leaders, those religious guys that thought they were big shots. Maybe we'll talk more about them a little bit later. But we're going to pick this up in Luke chapter 16, and beginning in verse 1. Um, the scriptures should tell us that Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So if you were here last week or you listened last week, you will recall, and I didn't catch it at the time, but uh, we talked about the owner of the vineyard and he goes out and he gets the, the workers, the laborers in, in different hours at different times throughout the day. And then it's just a small little detail, but, but at the end of the day, he asks his manager to have everyone line up 
from last to those that were there that came the latest to those that were there all day and pay them for their work. And it's it's I don't know if it how important it is to the detail of that story, but it wasn't the owner of the vineyard who did the paying. He asked his manager to do it. Well, this is a story about a rich man and the manager, someone who manages his affairs. All right. So we're sort of seeing some overlap here with these with these parables. So there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So you're fired, right? The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I like his wording there. I'm not strong enough. I'm, I'm kind of a wimp. Uh, manual labor, that's out. I'm probably not going to make it very far in, in that. I'm not strong enough to, to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Um, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So I might have made my, my boss angry, but I'll make everybody else love me. So, so he, he comes up with this plan, right? Um, so he called each one of his master's debtors, in verse 5, he called each one of his, uh, his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Verse 6, 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. We'll give you a deal if you pay today. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. I'm in, I'm in charge of, of what's his name's money, and, and I'm in charge of collections, and I, I'm going to reduce your bill if you can pay today. Uh, so take your bill, make it 800 instead of 1,000. For instance, says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world, Jesus goes on to say, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Jesus goes on in verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I'll just hit the pause button right there for a quick second. Remember when I said, I just said it. There's one thrust to this parable. There's one teaching to this parable. Are you with me? How to attain salvation is not it. <laughs> if you bend them too hard, they will break. Figurative language has its limits, right? This, this says to use your money to earn eternal dwellings. Let's pass the offering plate right now. Let's get our ushers. Let's get our ushers online. You can pay online. You can take care of it. Thank you for laughing. That was a joke. That was a joke. All right? Um, so this is not teaching how to get to heaven. That's not what the point of this parable is. Remember, the snotty Pharisees who think they're big shots are there. And, uh, and, and the scriptures go into more detail on that as well. So, so we're looking for the main thrust, not how to pay to, get, to earn our way to heaven. All right. But, but it is interesting. Um, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Um, verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. He's said things similar to that before. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I only stole $5 from you. You can trust me with 1000 That's different. Yeah, right. Um, all right. So then verse, what are we on? Verse 11. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? All right. So remember, the Pharisees are there. And money was a big deal to them. All right. So who will trust you with, with true riches? Um, he's, he's taking a stab at them. Like, guys, you are messed up. And, and God, God is not going to shower you with his blessings because of your heart attitude and the, and the way you feel towards money. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. Now, this probably sounds more familiar. 
No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, what does it say? Verse 14. The Pharisees who what? Love. Who loved money. They loved money. That's important to this story, okay? The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus, okay? He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. Think about what a fruitless practice that is. To jump on an adorable baby. Think about <laughs> what a fruitless practice it is to justify yourself in the sight of men. First of all, it's only going to work with some people. It's, it's difficult to do. And men don't really matter. It's God who matters, right? So, so Jesus um, spoke this to the Pharisees. Um, as they were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So there's a lot of strange verses there. If you've been a Christian for a while, maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you're not a Christian. Some of these verses, some of the things that Jesus said don't seem characteristic of Jesus. Now, of course, I want to revisit those. So I'm looking, reading all these parables this week, like, what do we want to talk about this week? And there's the big, there's the popular ones, the ones that everybody knows. We could, we could get into those and, and look a little more closely at those. But I, I, I read this one and went, this has enough strange things in it. And you know, I'm all about being strange, right? So yeah, I thought, if you can't get an amen one way, you know, you just, you know, I'll get it. I'll get it somehow. I'll get it one way or another. All right. So so, but I just thought this was really an interesting parable, uh, parable. So let's give you a little background. So this chapter includes two parables about wealth. The first one is the one that we read. And the Bible says that that was spoke primarily to the disciples. But the, the Pharisees were within earshot. They, they were there and, and heard it. The second parable was addressed to the Pharisees. Um, and uh, because of their response to the first parable. And you can, you can look that up yourself. So in the parable, I think you got this, but let's just make sure that I hit the, the main points. In the parable, there's a rich man. He calls his manager to give an account for his dealings. Not a great manager, hasn't done a great job. I think it's interesting. The scriptures don't at this point say that he's a crook, that he's a bad guy, that, that we don't know why. He just hasn't done the best job. Maybe he's irresponsible. Maybe he's lazy. Maybe he just makes poor decisions. We don't know exactly. It doesn't seem from the context as though he is, he's stealing or he's dishonest or anything like that at this point, right? Um, so uh, the rich man hears the manager was not handling uh, his finances wisely. And uh, in, of course, in, in this day, managers were hired by people to care for their finances, uh, for the finances of their estates. I want to say that probably happens in our day too. I just don't know many people who need someone to manage all of their money, right? Um, I, I am not there where I need someone to just, you just be in charge of these piles of money that I have, right? So I imagine we do this in our day too, but all right. So, so they were sort of like financial planners or trustees who control the finances and the estate with the purpose of making more money for the estate. Now, some Bible scholars said, you know, this guy says, you know, he's been sitting at the desk too long. He's not strong. He's like, oh, manual labor, that's out. I'm a big wimp. Uh, and then he goes, I'm, I'm too ashamed. I would be too ashamed to, to go out and be a beggar. And I think that would apply probably to most people. But it is interesting that when, when he manages the money, when he manages the money for a wealthy individual, it sort of looks like he's wealthy, right? It's sort of like, you know, he's, he's taking big shots out to dinner. He, he's playing 18 holes of golf with, with, uh, with important people, right? He, it's on him, right? So he, this money is at his disposal. He's living a pretty good life. So nobody wants to go out and, and be a beggar. But this guy probably, the fall for him would have probably been a, a, a great fall. So he's like, oh, I can't do that. I mean, everybody's going to, I mean, the questions, I won't, be able to, I won't be able to bear it. So he didn't, so the money didn't belong to him. It belonged to the estate. And somehow the manager was, was mismanaging. Um, at the beginning of the parable, the rich man is viewed as, sorry, at the beginning of the parable, uh, the rich man viewed his manager as irresponsible rather than dishonest, okay? Um, and then the manager is fired. And I sort of wondered, like, 
how, like, how did this, was it like, I'm going to hold your last paycheck until, you know, we get the finances, you're in charge of the finances, uh, I'm going to fire you, but like, I'm giving you two weeks notice, usually it works the other way around, like the guy leaving gives his two week notice, but the boss is like, you're fired, but first I want you to do all this work for me. So maybe I'm going to hold your paycheck or, you know, your final paycheck, or I'm going to give you a bonus, or maybe he was honorable in the sense that, you know, just help me straighten out my affairs, and then you gotta, you got to get down the road. Not exactly sure how that panned out, but he was told he was losing his job, and he still had his job for a while and retained some, some power and authority. So then what does he do? He goes uh, to somebody who says, well, I owe 800 gallons of olive oil. Uh, you know what? Just pay, just pay 400. I owe 1,000 bushels of wheat, just pay 800. So, you know, I'm reading a lot, and it's interesting. It's kind of fun to read all these different Bible scholars and see what their take is. Some parables they, they all agree on. Maybe there's some details that they differ on. But, but on some of the ones, you don't find agreement all the time. And then it's like, well, I wanted to, you know, I'm just, I'm just a lowly pastor. I want to read five scholars. They tell me what the answer is, and then I go in here and preach it. Somebody, somebody told me one time, one time, you're really smart. I said, I have a lot of books. I have a lot of books, you know? How does he know all this? Because I studied it this week. You're getting it a few days after I got it, right? Um, but I studied this. A little peek behind the curtain there. Uh, so I studied this, and, and then you find all these, these scholars that disagree. And so one guy said, you don't need to know this, but I thought it was interesting. One guy said, you know, Jesus is promoting this. Jesus is making a point. This is... Jesus is looking at this manager favorably. Well, how can we, what's the deal? And so, so this guy kind of figures, you know, he can't wrap his mind around that. How could Jesus be using this guy as a good example? And he said, you know, when he, when he says the, the olive oil, only pay 400. He says, you know, it, it's likely or possible that the manager kicked in the other 400. So, so I got, you know, a bird in the hand, right? This was a bill that was out there. And now you, you got paid, and I will make up the difference. Come on, somebody. I don't see anything in the text that says that the manager made up the difference for what is there. That is somebody going, that's a weird, that's a weird parable that Jesus would use. And tell us that we should be like the, the dishonest manager. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So next. Uh, so I had the thought, and nobody else had this thought, which means we should skip it, right? If it was only me and none of the brilliant scholars that I read to, to study for this message had the same idea, that's probably an indication that I was wrong. But I sort of thought like the bird in the hand kind of a thing, like you're owed 1,000, but I just got you 800. And who, know if you were, who knows if you were ever going to get that 1,000? So now there's, a, there's a, a, another pile of cash. Uh, I think that's more likely than the other scenario. Like, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm just wrapping up my job here. And I need oxen and carts to bring all the money as, I, as I've settled your affairs. Um, that may have been a component. That may have been part of what happened. Again, the Bible doesn't really say that. Um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that the, the, uh, the rich man was unhappy that all these debts were collected, even if, if they were a little less than what was owed. So... Um, so yeah, it's sort of a strange thing. So the, and the manager's thinking is reflected in the statement when he says, when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. I'm going to treat these debtors so well that I'll make friends because I, I, I'm reducing what they owe my present, my current employer. That's a little shifty. And Jesus says, you know, Christians, you really need to be more like that shifty guy. <laughs> All right? This is a, and it's a great example of, you know, interpreting parables. Like we get, what's the main, what's the main thrust of it? So uh, the, the Bible says that the, or Jesus said that the rich man commended the dishonest manager. Now that word dishonest is in there. So maybe before he would, just wasn't very good at his job. Now he's dishonest, right? And he was commended by his boss. Can you see the rich man going, wow, you tricky little rascal. You shifty, you, I mean... I, okay, you got, you got me, you got me. I, I was upset with you and thought you were doing a crummy job, but I'm impressed with your wisdom and, and your shrewdness and how you wrapped up these affairs. And, and the, the, his boss is actually like, all right, I did not see that coming. 
that, that's impressive, right? Sort of unexpected. Um, and it's not because the manager did a good thing. You say, well, maybe it is the bird in the hand thing. You know, maybe it is, but the scripture doesn't really tell us that. The manager was looking out for number one. He was looking out for himself. He was looking out for his own self-interest. You know, I'll, I'll use someone else's money to make friends, and, and then I'll use those relationships later on. And Jesus said, that's a pretty good, that was a good thing that he did. It wasn't a good thing that he did. Let me back that up. It was not a good thing that he did, but there were admirable things about what he did. Um, he had been careful to plan ahead. That seems to be part of what um, impressed the rich man and Jesus as well. Using material things to secure a future. Jesus wasn't teaching. Uh, hear me now. Uh, wake up and listen to this part. Um, Jesus was not teaching his disciples to be dishonest. Okay? He was teaching that they should use material things for future spiritual benefit. Remember, he said, use what you have now and you'll inherit eternal dwellings. Remember, the manager said, I'll, I'll use my boss's money and then I'll be welcomed into other people's homes. And Jesus said, yeah, you'll be welcomed home. You'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. He's, he's, there's a parallel here between this manager and, and what Jesus is, is asking of us. And, uh, and, and so he shrewdly, he's thinking about the future. Um, and, and it's also, as someone pointed out, and I, I wrote this down because I thought this was good. This is one of those good lessons from a bad example. Are you with me this morning? It's a good lesson from a bad example. All right, so J. Dwight Pentecost said, you can't, now every time, this is not the case. But sometimes when somebody says something, and I like it, but I don't want credit for it, you know, sometimes you want credit. Like, I'll just, tell, I'll just tell them that that's me, and they won't know the difference, right? But sometimes when you quote somebody, it's because you want to distance yourself. Like, oh, don't be upset with me. Be upset with J. Dwight Pentecost. I didn't say it. J. Dwight Pentecost said it. I just loved it and repeated what he said. Okay. Um, so, uh, Bible scholar, some of you are familiar with, with that name. He said this. The manager used his present opportunities with a view to receiving future rewards. So that's key. Use what you have now and think about the future. I heard the example one time, and I, I've used it since, that there's another you. There's the you in five years, and there's the you in 10 years. I told uh, my daughter recently, I said, hey, I got a phone call from the future you five years from now. She said, no, you did not. Uh, no, 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 I got a call from the future you from five years from now. And you know what the future, she, she had a message. For oh yeah, what's the message? She wanted you to know that she is grateful for the time that you did your homework and that you studied hard and that you, that you did well in school, right? Because anybody who's graduated from high school or hasn't graduated from high school can probably bear witness to life can be hard on you or life can be harder on you. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> life can be hard on you or life can be harder on you. And when you have senioritis, I know what senioritis feels like. When you have that, you can think, this is ridiculous. I just want to get on with my life. Well, well, <laughs> getting on with your life, you would be well served to study. Do your work, right? So the you in five years wants you to make good choices. The you in five years wants you to live for Christ. The you in five years wants you to be honorable and a person of character. The you in five years wants you to obey the law. The you in five years, uh, if, they, if, if that could only come back and haunt us, you know, like you really are blowing it, man. You need to straighten this out, right? So, so there is a future component that this manager was thinking, had the forethought, was planning and thinking about the future. That's admirable. Jesus admires that. The rich man admires that, not dishonest. And Jesus uses the word, the dishonest manager. He calls him dishonest. He's, he's, not, he's not advocating for dishonest behavior. Okay, I'm, now I'm preaching and I should be reading. All right, back to J. Dwight Pentecost. All right. The manager used his present opportunities with a view to receiving future rewards. In that sense, in that sense, he acted wisely. A foolish person lives only for the present. I'm just waiting. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, thank you. All right, good. Um, a foolish person lives only for the present. 
But a wise person, thank you, uses wealth to reap benefits in the future. The person of the world accepts this use of wealth as a fundamental business principle. Christ observed that the people of the world are, are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are people of the light or Christians. Jesus said, yeah, you know, I'm a big fan. How many of you know Jesus was a big fan of Christians? <laughs> yeah, it's like right in the name, right? Uh, but he's like, on this, the world has this part kind of, kind of figured out. You guys could learn from the world on this one. All right? So planning for the future was part of it. Uh, and then he goes on to say that Christ was saying that the disciples should use sound business practices and the use of their time and privilege. You hear the bells going off? You hear the alarms? Privilege, that word, we use, we've been using that word a lot lately. Privilege. J. Dwight Pentecost said, you should use your privilege. J. Dwight Pentecost said that. I didn't say that, J. Dwight Pentecost. Uh, and wealth. Not for the present, but with a view to the future. Um, let's go back up and look. Let's take a look at, uh, uh, I didn't jot down the verse. Okay, verse 9. Look what Jesus says. What a strange thing. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. If I had just, if you hadn't read that, maybe we should check the computer. If you hadn't seen that yourself, would you think you just misquoted the Bible? Jesus did not say to use wealth to get friends. That does not sound like something that Jesus would say. But, that, but, but that's not, he's even outside the parable now. Now he's interpreting it for us. This, this is not, we're outside the story now. This is Jesus telling. So here's the point, everybody. You should use what you have to gain friends. That's weird sounding to me. I mean, I think that sounds strange. Um, now, what's the larger context of that? Use what you have to spread the gospel. Use what you have for eternal things. Think about your future. Think about the future of others. Think about the future of your family. And use natural things. In other words, he didn't divorce the natural from the spiritual. The natural can accomplish spiritual things. So, so let's, let's, let's just say this right now. In, in case I lost anybody, I like money. Anybody, anybody with me? Anybody? Okay, it's Lakeside. We're just we, we're honest. We know it. Like money's great. You know, money's great. Um, I, I am not burning it. I'm not warming my hands on cold winter days by burning it. Right. So I'm a I'm a fan of money, but I don't love money. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? It's the loving of money. Money is a, is a tool, right? So I, I've never been accused of being a prosperity preacher yet. In fact, it dawned on me, uh, actually this week didn't dawn on me, but I was, uh, I re was reminded how much Jesus actually talks about money, and I avoid it because I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to ever be accused of that. But, you know, if you avoid talking about money because you don't want to talk about money, you're, you're not preaching on a lot of the scriptures. You with me this morning? And so I'm not a prosperity preacher, and I don't love money. It is a tool. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not turning it away, right? I mean, maybe, maybe sometimes, you know. Um, but, but, but Jesus, let's, let's expand it beyond money. Jesus is saying, use what you have. Use your, if I can use the words of J. Dwight Pentecost, your time, your position, your, your station in life. And even your money, if I can use those things to advance the gospel, then we should do it. Amen. And the, the word privilege is kind of, a, uh, it's kind of a hot button word right now. Jesus is saying to use our privilege. Say, well, you know, is it, is it white privilege or is it what, you know, uh, m maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not out fighting. I'm not carrying a sign for more white privilege, more white privilege, right? That's not, I'm not into that. We've discussed this before. Do you have certain advantages and privileges in life? 
when you live in a country that is whatever percentage white, might there be some advantages to looking like most of the other people? I think it's fair to say that that's true, right? In China, is there Chinese privilege? In Africa, is there black privilege? It can't say African-American, they're Africans. Um, somebody, oh, they're African-Americans, not in Africa! Is there, is there black privilege? Right. Okay. Is that fair? Uh, I don't know. Now we've said I've said this before, but what other kind of privilege is it? There's tall privilege. Amen. There's short privilege. If you're short, if there, if you're short, you can go into the attic of our church. And, <laughs> I don't have to follow you. I don't have to follow you. And like seriously, what does it say? We say it takes about three conks in the head before you realize those trusses are for real, man. They're they're not to be played with. Some people have been knocked out by those trusses, right? So, yeah, short privilege. You can just go up there willy-nilly, man, just not paying attention or anything. Is there intelligence privilege? Yeah, yeah, I'm against that, by the way. I'm fighting against that. <laughs> it's not fair. It's not fair to the dumb people, right? Um, is there attractive privilege? Are you kidding? There has to be. I was sort of preaching my message to Alex on the way into church this morning, and she said, charisma privilege. How about if you are a nice person? That's not, that's not even attached to something like tall, short, whatever. That's, that's like something that you can work on yourself. Is there charisma privilege? Is there, is there like if you're uh, good with people, is that going to help you in life? Uh, yeah. Should you use that to help win people to Jesus? Of course you should. So we went to the Passion Conference years ago, and it's down in, it was down in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, that was a fun trip. And uh, something happened. You get your tickets online, and all the kids, you know, it's a youth thing, but I drove down there, you know, I'm getting a ticket. And something happened with the online, the registration stuff. I, my ticket didn't come through, and I, I had no ticket. Even though I paid for it, I had no ticket. And uh, so there was some kind, of, some kind of glitch in the system. And the kids said, well, you can't get in. What, you know, that's a shame. And I was like, I'll get in. I'm like, no, you don't have your ticket. I'm like, watch me get in. Like, I'm going to, but that's a big deal and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is, this is right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> I go up, a little finesse, some charisma, a compliment or two. Has to be legit. You can't make it up. You can't lie, right? You can't lie at the Passion Conference. Um, <laughs> a little schmoozing, a little charisma, a, a, a joke or two, and I'm in, man. Who needs a ticket? I was shocked. They didn't let me in. <laughs> you can see it still haunts me to this day. I looked shady, perhaps. Perhaps it was my shady appearance. Man, that's some tight security at that Christian conference, man. Like, you didn't pay. You ain't getting in, joker. Um, we figured it out the next day. I couldn't believe it. And, and I bragged to the kids, too, which made it worse. I'm like, you watch. You watch what I do. You watch how I waltz right in there. Use the pastor card and the whole thing. Like, pastor, we don't care. You're a pastor. Get out. Um, we all have we all have some advantage. I said this before. I have loving parent advantage. I have parent uh, non-divorced parent advantage. Doesn't mean well, I'm still not sitting in the giant house and with uh, you know money falling out of my pockets. Um, but is it advantageous if parents stay together for children? Yeah. Mo most, ca most cases, yeah, yeah, sure it is. So we all have different levels and different degrees. And I remember when I heard um, a, a gentleman I, I respect said, you know, you'd be crazy not to use the privilege that you have because life is tough and life will beat the tar out of you. Which is why I said life can be hard or life can be harder. Jesus said, all right, whatever, whether it's fair, whether it's not, whether it's racist, whether whatever. I mean, those are all different conversations than what I'm talking about. But Jesus said, whatever privilege you have, use it, baby. Not, maybe not the NIV version, but some other version says, <laughs> Jesus said, use it, baby. I love that when I saw that. Because we all have something. Some of us have less. That's the world we're in. It's, not a, it's a fallen world. It's brutal. That's why Jesus came to save us. This place is dangerous and unfair. But what if we can use what we have 
to glorify God. What if we could do that? What if we could use whatever, we, and money's a part of it. You say, well, uh, you know, I don't have that much money. You have something. You have something. You've got charisma. You've got a, you got a winning personality. You've got a fantastic sense of humor or a brilliant mind. How can you use those things? Jesus said, you would be smart. You would be wise. Look at this manager is shrewd. He uses what he has. He thinks about the future. He is resourceful, and he figures out a way to plan for the future. And Jesus said, Christians ought to be more like that. That's crazy. I don't know how you get something else. If you get something else out of this parable, it gets weird fast. <laughs> That's why I said the, the one guy's like, he must have paid the difference. Jesus couldn't be using the bad guy as, as an example for this. Well, he, well, he is. He, he said on that the world is good. They, they figured it out. They, they know. Now, we're not talking about cheating and swindling and being dishonest and doing shady things. We're not t Jesus wasn't talking about that. We're not advocating that here either. But use whatever we have to promote the gospel, to promote Jesus. Great, great story. Years ago, uh, my dad used to work for this company, and they gave him, for whatever reason, a giant duffel bag full of, some of you know the story, full of inflated, like, soccer balls, footballs, anything that you would inflate. Basketballs, I imagine, were there. But a lot, a lot of soccer balls. And our friends from Uganda came over, and, uh, and I don't remember how this came about, but my dad said, hey, would you, would, would you be interested in a bag full? I think it might have been two, two big duffel bags. Um, I know there's one. I think there was actually uh, more than that. Um, but full of, like, soccer balls and stuff. So you've seen... TV and movies, like there's some places in Africa, it's not everywhere, but some places they don't have a whole lot. But if you got a soccer ball, you got a good time, right? You can, you can entertain yourself with a soccer ball. It's a big deal. Plus they watch, you know, they watch soccer and that so a, a lot more than Americans do. And, uh, and so he gives this pastor um, this duffel bag full of soccer balls. And so he gets back to Africa and he, and he divides them up. And he gives them, so the schools are private there. The government doesn't have a lot of money, not a lot of tax revenue in Uganda. And so there's private schools. So a lot of times it's a Christian school or it's a Muslim school. Maybe there's a government school, I don't know. But it's usually Christian or Muslim. I think we passed a, a Hindu school when I was there. And so this pastor gives the Muslim, uh, I guess, principal. Yeah, it's a principal. Like, I don't know. Uh, uh, Maybe the whole duffel bag or a large portion of the duffel bag of all these, um, of all these uh, inflatable uh, balls. And the Muslim principal said, are you hearing me this morning? We are no longer a Muslim school. We are a Christian school. Because my dad gave him a bunch of soccer balls. <laughs> now, you can't, look, you can't make somebody become a Christian, right? You can't, like, it's a heart thing, right? But you can run your school. You can, throw out, you can toss out the Koran and start teaching the Bible. You can espouse Christian principles instead of espousing Islamic principles. And so the, the school, how, how it taught and what they did and what they said, it went from Muslim to Christian because somebody used the resources, what am I going to do with these dopey soccer balls, man? <laughs> like, it's a, like, maybe I'll keep one, you know, the fancy one and the expensive looking one. And what am I going to do with the rest? I'm not that athletic. Who are we kidding, right? <laughs> if soccer balls can have an entire school begin to teach Christian principles and biblical principles instead of something else, that's using what you have to advance the gospel. And it didn't cost my dad anything. I think they all had, you know, like his company's logo on there or, or something like that. Using what we have, taking advantage of wherever we're at in life. I got another great story, but I don't have time to tell it. All right, I'll move on. Um, I'll just, you've heard it before, some of you. Um, all right, let's, let's wrap this up. Jesus commending the dishonest manager. I do that just to mess with you, but it is, I don't know. Um, okay, I'll say it quick. I'll say it quick. They, they know it. They know it. I'm, yeah. Um, so, okay, so I, I never look at my receipts. See, now you're like, I wish we wouldn't have said that. I never look at my receipts. 
I never do. Um, and one day I decided to look at a receipt once, like there's been like three times in my life. And because I was suspicious, because the way this transaction took place at, uh, at Lowe's, um, something seemed off about it. Like th there was an expensive item that was set off to the side. Remember the story now? Some of you are like, we know this one. Um, expensive item was set off to the side, and I thought, did, did they? And so I get home, and I actually checked the receipt to see. And they didn't charge me. It's like 50 bucks or something. Um, so so it, wasn't, it wasn't on there. So I got the expensive thing for free. It didn't get scanned for whatever reason. So I went, I went back, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, I got back there as fast as I could. How many of you know, number one reason why I went back? I'm an honest person. Come on, help me out. Somebody, help me out. That's, number, that's probably number one. All right. How many of you also know we have mixed motives? None of us are, none of us are free and pure, 100%. We all are a combination of mixed motives. You just have to give, lean into the better motives, right? Um, so I'm an honest person. I would have felt bad about that. Um, but probably second motive was, man, I'm a Christian, and I hope this opens up a dialogue. Because I know a whole lot of people, they get a 14-cent cheeseburger extra, and, and they think they won the lottery, you know? So I've got this expensive thing. So I'm going back, and I hope it opens up a dialogue. I don't tell people I'm a pastor. Here's where my church is at. And, you know, Jesus is great, and I would have stolen from your store, like not this, but other things, if I didn't know Jesus, right? So I'm hoping for the conversation, right? We're, 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 a mi we're mixed motives. We're mixed motives. And then there's a the tiny little pride part that says, I want to be admired. <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> you know that's true. You know that's true. Now, it depends on who you're trying to impress. Somebody goes, you're an idiot. You took that back, 50 bucks. You're a moron. I am not impressed. So it depends on who you want to impress. Was there a tiny part of me that was like, I hope there's, I hope a crowd gathers, you know? <laughs> all, for, all for the glory of God. And Lakeside Family Church is in Stevensville. It's on Red Arrow Highway. You should come. It's a great place. What's the rest of the story? Those of you that know, what's the rest of the story? The clerk didn't make a big deal. I was so disappointed. The, cl the clerk was like in a bad mood and like took the thing and like didn't say like, what are you doing? Um, like, does this happen every day? People return stuff that they got for free from your store? But there was a customer that said, wait a second, <laughs> your return, you, had, you got that for free? Am I hearing this right? I said, yeah, I, I took this home and I realized it was like a week or two later. Um, and I brought it back because I, I want to pay, I want to pay for it. I didn't want to pay for it. I'm not stupid. I don't want to pay. I don't want to pay for it. I'm still a sinner. Um, and they were, they're like, I can't, I can't believe you're doing this. I can't, uh, which was nice. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Jesus got to throw me a little bone here. Because the cashier was like, whatever, dude, this, I don't even. They were so uninterested. I was ready to make my mark. You know, revival was going to, we were going to build a new church. It was a, And that was probably God going, eh, you know, we'll give you a little, but yeah, you're out of control, Petty. All right. Um, so look, I'm being honest, mixed motives. But it did part, part of, not 100%, come on, a part of the reason I did that was because I hope this opens up a dialogue. And I want people to know this is, what, this is how Christians act. This is what Christians do. They, I, this, does, this doesn't belong to me. And uh, now I, I had a conversation with somebody, but, you know, they didn't. They, weren't, they didn't meet me at the parking lot the following Sunday morning. But, um, but that's part of the reason why I did that. My motivation was to use whatever situation. And let's say the thing was $1,000. Let's say it was more. Like, all the more, use that thing to try to, like, because that takes some of the sting out of it. Like, like I'm going to return this thing. But I do want something for it. I, I do want, I, I want an opportunity to glorify the Lord as a result of that. And so there was some of that. So Jesus said, you know, we, have, we talk about refrigerator verses. You put a verse up on your refrigerator. You put one as your, as your wallpaper on your computer. Kids, ask your parents what a computer is. It's, yeah. it's, bigger, than the, it's bigger than that. But, um, you know, you put your scripture on there to remind you of the scripture. I don't know that anybody's ever put, use worldly wealth to gain friends. I don't know that, that anybody's like, that's really, do you have a life verse? You know, people say, you should have a verse for your whole life. My life verse is to use my wealth to make friends. Um, maybe not. That's not such, maybe, maybe not. 
So Jesus is saying, look, money's okay, money's fine, money's a tool. But you know what? You know what? If you live for money, you're really taken. You're, you're going to have a low-level existence if, if, you're, if your life is about. I said before, I was kind of playing with, like, I like money, money's fine. But I do not live for money. Like, money's great. But that, my life is not focused on money. I have meaning and purpose that goes beyond what's, what's in the bank or, or in my pocket. Jesus goes on to say, so, you, so use, your, use whatever you have to promote the gospel. Uh, okay, I just got to hit these other points. Uh, I was going to talk about them, but I don't have time. Jesus said, use your privilege, use your time, use your wealth, use whatever you have. Use, the, use whatever you have. Um, but he, then he goes on to say that if you can be trusted with, with he says natural things, like material things, you can, uh, you can be trusted with true riches. So again, that's a stab at the Pharisees, right? Like you guys are. So the Old Testament says, if you follow God's laws, God will bless you. Okay, fair enough. So the Pharisees set, made, it, uh, uh, made it their aim in life to accumulate the most wealth and to show it off to everybody. Everybody has to see it. Everybody has to know it because that's proof that God likes me best. Right? So I drive the nicest car, I live in the biggest thing, I wear the nicest stuff. I, any way they could show it, they showed it, because in their world and in their mind, me, the more money I have shows you how much more God loves me and how good of a person I am than you. Now, is it true that the Old Testament promised blessings on people for, uh, uh, for, for obeying God's law? Certainly. That's in the scriptures. The Pharisees, in typical fashion, perverted it and distorted it and made it something that it wasn't. So these are the people that Jesus is talking to. These are the reason, I mean, he said, that, he said it to the, his disciples, but he said it, he wanted the Pharisees to hear this, and the Bible goes on to say that. So um, if we can be trusted with earthly things, God can entrust us with true riches, Jesus said. All right, you have to read more of that on your own. And finally, the last thing, Jesus drew um, from the parable <clears throat> that a person can't serve both God and money. You can serve God and have money, but if, you, but if you serve money, then there's not much room for God in your life. As masters, the two are mutually exclusive. The love for money, uh, someone said, will drive one away from God. If God is our master, then money is our servant, right? It's a tool that we use. It's a thing that we use. Um, Henry Felding, I don't know who that is, but he wrote, make money... Uh, make money your God, and it will plague you like the devil. He goes on to say, Jesus said, make money your servant and use today's opportunities as investments in tomorrow's dividends. Amen. All right, let's, let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we uh, it's the money thing is just weird. You know, like you got the, the prosperity preachers that, you know, they highlight the verses and the scriptures that talk about money almost to the exclusion of, of Jesus. Like, that's kind of like what they're even known for. And, uh, and Lord, so money, it gets weird. It gets kind of weird with us when it comes to money. But, Lord, help us as believers to view money rightly, appropriately, and to view money as a tool that we can use as Christians. Lord, if we are... <coughs> If we're, if we're caught up in the pursuit of finances. Look, what was good about the, the shrewd manager? He thought about the future. Thinking about the future involves relationships and it involves money. So we're not, you know, we're not getting rid of all of our money. We're not, that's not what, what this is. It's a, it's a healthy, balanced view. That money is something that I use. It's, uh, it has some value to me, but I don't live for it. It serves me. I don't serve money. Money serves me. Help us as believers to have that attitude. And in the larger context, Lord, you said, I can't escape. I can't escape. What you said, use whatever we have in life to benefit the kingdom. Use whatever position we have to plan for the future. Now, that's not just us, but that's us looking out for others as well. You know, my, my, part of my motivation in the ministry is thinking about the future, not of myself, but for others. Without Jesus, the future is pretty great. 
That's a motivating factor for me. Lord, we just uh, we want to have a healthy balance of, uh, of our appreciation and use of, of money in our lives. But, but that just speaks to the larger idea of thinking about our lives differently. Thinking about maybe, maybe that thing that you have, maybe the extra stuff, maybe that could be given to somebody as a way to open up a door. Maybe the use of something that you that you have. You don't want to get rid of it, you need it, so okay, but you you loan it to somebody or you, you let them use it. Maybe you do maybe you do just give it away. It could be it could be explored so much more, but it's so strange to my ear. I think it's, I don't think it's just me. When Jesus says use money to gain friends. Lord, I hear your heart telling us to use whatever we can to reach a lost and dying world. Lord, help us to to not only to remember, but to, to put the attitude, the shrewdness, the shrewdness of the dishonest manager into our lives. It's amazing. Jesus said, you know what, you could learn something from this dishonest guy. Lord, help us to be shrewd in our dealing with others. Not dishonest, not crafty. But wise. Taking advantage of what we have for the benefit of others. Lord, we ask that this morning in the awesome and in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, so we don't have, I don't know if that video is going to play, Patty. <coughs> I think I solved the problem in the middle of the sermon somewhere. Yeah, it was, right, yeah, it was right in the middle of the sermon. The computer had an update this week, right? Yep. I think that's why I won't play the video. Yeah. Right? That, that, would, that would explain it. Uh, if you see Bill Gates, tell him to use his money to make friends with us because we're pretty angry. <laughs> <laughs> Thing updates, and then we can't use it for a month. Um, we were, we were going we to show you a quick video on... Uh, you will recall that it's Child Abuse Prevention Month. We said that we would be talking about that. My wife had to remind me that it's Child Abuse Prevention Month. I thought at first she said Child Abuse Month. I told myself not to tell that joke. I said, don't say that. That's in terrible taste. That's um, great. But uh, yeah, it's child. But I did. But I did at one point say Child Abuse Month or something. No, no, it's Child Abuse Prevention. Prevention. The prevention. Very important work. Um, and we were going to show you a video on on that topic, uh, but it's it's not going to it's not going to play for us. But um, but I would just and, and it was on. You can look this up yourself. It was on. It was like a two minute video on identifying the signs of child abuse. I said, Renee, that's pretty intense. She's like, Well, that's the world that a ton of people are in, right? So many people live that. Like, I have a nice squeaky clean life. You know, like I don't, I don't really want to think about that stuff. But I, I, I wouldn't be happy if I saw something and went, that's that's weird. I don't understand why that happened. Huh? Ah, and then find out later that I, I was catching on to something that because I didn't know um, someone suffered abuse for who knows how much longer in their life. So it's it's not a fun topic, but what an important topic. And you know, Renee, from being a teacher, like she like it's the teachers. The teachers are good at that stuff, right? Um, and you can, uh, I mean, so many, so many things. A kid does something odd, and I'm like, that's a, the weirdest thing in the world. And like, nope, that's because of abuse. Oh, well, that that makes sense. And so because she has some information and knows some things about it, she can identify it, and then be a part of a solution. Um, so we just want to remind you of that. Also, I, I want to just tell you quickly, um, we have uh, something coming up. Uh, May 5th, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. So those of you that are, are Amazon Prime subscribers, um, <clears throat> there's a movie on Amazon Prime right now. The name of it escapes me. I will get you the name. It's, uh, it's like the Travels of the Apostle Paul or something like that. Maybe somebody's seen it. 
Uh, I looked, I found it on there. And it's, uh, it's an archeologist that's kind of going through Turkey and the Middle East <clears throat> and kind of following the path that, that Paul took in his three missionary journeys. And it's, it's supposed to be, I haven't seen it yet, supposed to be remarkable, visually stunning, incredible, incredible stuff. And um, a friend of ours is friends with the gentleman that directed that movie. So I don't know about you, I have no movies that I've directed that are presently on Amazon right now. That could change. It probably won't. But, but you know, it's a movie, it's a movie on Amazon. So, uh, and you can check that out if you'd like. But because he's the friend of a friend, we're going to show that on, I know it's Cinco de Mayo, where a, what's the word? Sombrero. You can't say that. So, well, I just said it. So, crying river. Wear your sombrero and Cinco de Mayo. That makes you feel better. Um, nobody's harmed. Uh, but, but, are you nervous? Take a breath. It's okay. It's okay. It's built up to be more than it is. It's fine. I calculate these things. That joke was planned last week. Um, but he will be here. He will be here. And after we watch the movie, uh, he's going to answer questions. So that's going to be awesome. So um, his name is Matt. His last name escapes me at the moment. Hope he's not watching. Hi, Matt. Um, but uh, and again, it'll come to me in the middle of the song. When I miss the note, that's what happened. Um, the last name. Uh, but I think it's cool. Just, just, the, the movie is supposed to be awesome all by itself. And then to have the director here to answer our questions, that's going to be amazing. So May 5th, invite some folks to come to that. Um, all right. Do you have anything? Yeah. An apology? Is it an apology for me? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. No, Maybe that's never. Uh, we have it in the bull bulletin, not the bullpen, the bulletin. Uh, there's a uh, Saturday, May 1st. We already announced it last week. It's in the bulletin, 9 a.m. Uh, men's work day. There's a little bit of a breakfast, a couple rolls and some coffee will be there. But uh, important, sign up for it if you're interested in doing that so we can get a head count and know what uh, tools to throw at you, right, Jim? The other announcement is uh, uh, Allison put this little uh, flyer in here for offering. Uh, there's the, uh, what is that, the QR code? Is that what the kids do these days? You yeah, take a, a picture and then it's, so it's convenient. You take, snap a picture of that, brings you right to the pay screen uh, so you can pay online or for your convenience we have the uh, trays set out at the end of service. So as you're walking out, you can just drop your uh, offering in the plate. Awesome. Is that right? <coughs> that's correct. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Allison. I think that's well. it. Oh, oh, I'll just say this real quick. Some of you know Taylor and Teresa. They are our friends, and they are moving away this week. And they have, all right, anybody see my wife's crazy video where she's, Brian, yes. like, yeah. like, she cries. And uh, so, so Taylor and Teresa fostered three, three. I think I only knew of two, but fostered three children. And they are remaining in the area. Thank you, Jeff and Becky. They're not busy. Jeff and Becky are busy. Uh, Teresa and Taylor are moving away. I hope that you uh, just bless them, say goodbye to them. We will, you will be missed. And we're sorry to see you go. But this is the last Sunday that, that, that you'll be with us until you come back and visit. Um, but we're grateful for the time that we had with you and your ministry to the kids that we love. So um, so thank you so much for that. So do you greet on the way out? Just just say goodbye to them tonight. Be nice to them. But we're not going to see them for a while. All right. But we wanted to uh, thank you for your service to children. In, uh, in the area. And so the foster kids are still in the area, if I didn't make that clear. So, <clears throat> did I say everything? <laughs> um, it's best I just be quiet now. Amen. Right, let's, uh, he's not lying. Let's go out, let's go out with a song. <laughs>
Señor.